one. Michael. Hey everyone, welcome to the Four Corners. This is the second video um, featuring Mazzy in Seattle, Michael, 45 RPM audio file in Dusseldorf. I'm Michael in Austin, Texas, noted and archived. And our guest today is Michael Johnson, Poetry on Plastic, um, based in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, if you missed the first video, um, look back to any of our channels. Um, that was with Barack Apita, where we covered jazz. Today, we'll be covering classical music. And um, Michael Poetry on Plastic was gracious enough to give us his time, and hopefully we'll shed some light on the world of classical vinyl. Um, he is an oboist in the Tucson Symphony, uh, based in Arizona. And check out his channel, uh, which will be in the link below, for tons of overviews on classical vinyl and pressings and labels and all that goodness. So the format, we will each show one album, talk about it, um, and we'll kind of each chime in. I'll be talking about some of the musical aspects in the performance. Um, Michael, 45 RPM audio file, we'll be talking about the pressing, the collectability, how to find it, if you can find it, how much money it will cost. <laughs> As you will be talking about some of the design, photography aspects of the packaging and the, the visual optics, and then um, MJ, Michael Johnson, will be just chiming in with all the knowledge he has. Uh, but first, we kind of wanted to give a quick background on how we each got into classical music and classical vinyl in particular. Um, MJ, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, um, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, despite being a classical musician and, and having been, uh, you know, playing classical music since I was, you know, relatively young, um, a lot of how I got into vinyl and got into the audio community was through um, growing up in, in the punk and hardcore scene, actually. Um, and so a lot of the first records I had were, were punk records because what would happen is I'd go to shows and um, eventually you get to a time where people stop selling CDs and the only physical medium people are selling is vinyl records. And that kind of got me interested and curious about the format. And it wasn't really till a couple years later that I, that I um, started kind of connecting what I was training to do with, um, you know, appreciation of vintage recordings of uh, classical music on vinyl and all the different aspects of, of that kind of world. It took a lot longer to get into because of, sound quality and pressings and things like that. It was, it was a bit more complicated. Great. Um, and I got into classical music very late in my listening career just a few years ago, and largely due to the VC, uh, MJ, Michael Poetry and Plastic, um, shedding light on a lot of the different pressings. Um, of course, I'm sure I share sentiment with uh, Dusseldorf Michael um, in the analog productions living stereo represses and kind of the more audiophile represses from the last 10 years from the classic era um, from the 50s and such um, but I'm still pretty green so I'm excited uh, to learn about this and uh, you know previously I digging in the bins in the record shops you see there's so many variations of every piece of music from you know from the original from the classic core of, of the history of classical music so um, there's a lot to learn about, especially if you want the best sounding pressing. And of course, each company or each conductor has their own slight variation on, on a work. So I'm excited to learn and share with you a few pieces from my collection. Uh, Mazzy, how did you get into? Well, of course, I, how I get into every kind of music, uh, has, it's been the Beatle connection. And for me, classical music came out in the sound, in 1965, the soundtrack to the movie Help had two major classical pieces in it. Had a clip of Beethoven's Night Symphony, The Ode to Joy, uh, where Ringo and the tiger are d uh, down under uh, in the basement, and the tiger's lulled by the Ninth Symphony. I fell in love with that symphony. Obviously one of the most uh, famous, iconic pieces used in movies, television. But to me, it is still a stunning piece. The Ode to Joy section of that, every time I hear it, is just so heroic. Also on that record is um, uh, Wagner's play, uh, Prelude to Lohengrin, Act Three, and it's just so dramatic. Years later, when I worked in record stores, I referred to the, uh, Wagner as sort of the Led Zeppelin of classical music. Now, MJ or anyone else would might say differently, but just the 
the grandeur, even how his music is used in uh, the film Apocalypse Now. So for me, it comes from a cultural stance. Uh, my first record, which I show, which I'll show a little later, 2001, was a major turning point. But a part where I really learned the most in 1973 was my first record uh, store job when I was uh, nine, just barely 19 at uh, Warehouse Records, a California music chain. And the strange thing about that record chain is their classical section wasn't just under Beethoven or or the composer Salty or Bernstein or the you know conductor. Everything was listed by Schwann catalog number. If you know about the Schwann catalog, it was this monthly book that came out literally since the 40s or 50s, all the way through the 90s. And it was a monthly book that had mostly classical and soundtracks in it. And you'd go to the section and everything was listed. So that I learned about all these classical labels, Deutsch Grammophon, Angel Classics, uh, Columbia Masterworks, Angel Records, which is subsidiary of EMI, and, and then the budget label, Seraphin, non-such classics, and so on. So when a customer came in and wanted a Beethoven, you couldn't just go, or Beethoven's Ninth, you couldn't go to the Beethoven's Ninth. You had to look in the friggin' Swan catalog and learn it, and which number. It was the most frustrating thing, but the, the two years I worked there, I learned who composed what. Von Karahan was the Deutsch gramophone person. Bernstein was all of Columbia, you know, I got to know all the stuff and in turn started getting some promos and got to know the music a little more because I, I kind of, at least I had to talk about it. It was frustrating, but uh, it was probably the best education I got at 19, 20 years old for classical music. Great. Michael. Michael in Dusseldorf. My turn. First, first I want to know, Mezzi, you really look formal. Great outfit. Well, when you, I figured when you go to the opera, you go to the symphony, you dress up. You don't wear a friggin' bowling yeah, right. outfit or golf shirt. <laughs> so, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Once in a while, like, look, at, we can't d get dressed up and go out anymore for the time being. So, you know, it was, yeah. it's for the Michaels. I feel <laughs> sort of ganged on. I got three Michaels and a Mazzy. They walk into a bar. <laughs> really like it. Really like it. <laughs> So how did I get into classical music? It, 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 started, it started during my streaming period. <laughs> um, I, I, I was very heavy into the ECM label. Probably you all know that the jazz label. But ECM is not only jazz. ECM has a sub label. It's called the new series. And in this new series, they, they are all about classical music, modern, uh, classical, classical music. And that was my, my first time when, when I got in touch with, with classical music. And then, of course, when I started my audiophile career, um, I, 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 I uh, uh, relatively uh, quick learned about Living Stereo and the Everest uh, editions. And those blew me away, and, and that even drags me deeper into that kind of music. And of course, there are also the early years, let's say the first five or six years of the electric recording company. They also put out only classical editions, which, which, which was another edition. So that, that was the reason I, I, I am dragged into this classical music. So... But maybe now it's time to show the first record. What do you think? Yeah, you guys go in the same order. So MJ, Phoenix, what do you have to what do you have to share with us? Okay, yeah, I, I had well, of course, I had trouble picking five records because you know why wouldn't I? Um, and I, I kind of went the route of of music and and pieces and performances that really were important to me, rather than just showing you know the rarest labels that I have with me here. But um, I picked one that you probably all know. This is um, the Analog Productions reissue of Fritz Reiner and the Chicago Symphony, Scheherazade. Um, this is probably my number one recommendation whenever one, anyone asks me like, oh, I'm trying to get into classical on vinyl, you know, what should I get? I say, you know, if you're not used to classical music, this is a great place to start. It's exciting, it's um, very tuneful, um, and, and the music uh, has, a, has a flowing lyricism that you know, very few people are going to dislike. Um, and this record is, is important to me for a number of reasons. I mean, 
all of these old Chicago Symphony Fritz Reiner recordings, growing up in the classical community, um, the Chicago Symphony is really kind of held on a pedestal. Um, everyone talks about the Chicago Symphony with reverence, especially the big brass sound. Well, the sound and the level of the Chicago Symphony was really something that Fritz Reiner in his tenure established. Um, he was the person that made the Chicago Symphony the Chicago Symphony, um, mostly through a reign of terror from what I know. Um, I remember hearing stories where, you know, he would, uh, he would just basically try to whittle out the bad players and get rid of them. Um, you know, they'd be in a rehearsal and he'd, you know, go, oh, uh, inside uh, third stand, second violin, play measure 43 for me in front of the whole orchestra. Um, and uh, the orchestra got better. You know, say what you will, but the orchestra got better. Um, be you know, he wasn't the most... Uh, he didn't have the most intellectual interpretations of a lot of music, but um, he was a very competent conductor and a very uh, competent music director. And the playing on this, especially on oboe, um, Ray Still, and, and all the woodwind features, and especially in the second movement, are just beautifully played. And this is still, this is a recording that, uh, you know, even outside of the vinyl community and the classical collector community, this is a recording that my peers um, still, you know, reference and talk about. What year was that recorded? This is, I believe, 1960. Yeah, 1960. It, it's funny because it reminds me from a design point of view. Can you hold that up again? From a yeah. design point of, view, that re point of view, that reminds me of the Cinerama films that came out in the early 60s. Hatari, How the West Was Won, has that big headline, those graphic typeface. And especially, like, that looks like a soundtrack. I know it's not, but it's got that. I mean, almost like a Hitchcockian uh, title too. You're right. Topaz, Topaz or something. Beautiful cover. And that, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. a different typeface, but it's the same kind of treatment as that in a way. It, it, you look like it could be the same thing. Of course, that's part of the um, RCA uh, Living Stereo series too. I, I don't know if I've ever heard an original Shaded Dog of this because they, they do get a little pricey. That's why I think the $35 for the AP is really great. But um, I've also heard the double 45 of this now that is even better. Uh, if you don't mind getting up to change sides every single movement, the double 45 is, is mind blowing. Can you pronounce that slowly, the name of that again? Scheherazade. Oh, it's easy? Okay, just yeah. like it sounds, just like it looks. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a few, a few pieces on that, a few movements in that, in that piece of music are pretty, even if you've not heard them or you haven't thought you've heard them, you probably have, right? Yeah, like the, the uh, well, the, the second movement, um, which is the, you know, the, they pass the theme around, the storytelling theme, and then there's also the Festival of Baghdad. I mean, the whole, the, the, it's a, the symphony is basically a tone poem talking about, you know, Scheherazade and the Arabian Nights, if any of you have ever read the Arabian Nights stories. Um, it's, it's illustrative of stories from that. And as far as the instrumentation, for those of us who are new to classical or don't know anything about classical, um, what is the typical number of um, instruments on, in, a, in a symphony for a, for a piece something like this? Uh, I mean, it's a normal, normal, uh, you know, late 19th century size orchestra. So, you know, um, we're talking probably like a 60, 70 person orchestra, maybe, um, maybe a little bit lower, maybe 55 ish, you know, in that range. Depending on the budget. Yeah, depending on the budget, because I mean, the string section, you know, they don't write each, you know, it's not violin stand one, viol they don't write that in the part, it's just violin one and violin two, and however many you want to add to the orchestra is, is the choice of the music director. Awesome. Great first choice, great. Because that record was recommended by, by my, one of my subscribers, he wrote in the comment, Michael, you have to go into that Sheherazad, and I did, and it's outstanding, it's an outstanding recording this living stereo, gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, I'll go next. And uh, I have, this is a Latvian kind of contemporary composer, Arvo Pert, I believe I'm saying that right. Yes, you are. Okay. Um, and he's definitely on the more minimal side uh, of composing, um, does a lot of sacred music, does a lot of work uh, for choral, choral stuff. This is Spirulina, which is one of his most uh, famous pieces um, with another song called Spiegel am Spiegel, which I believe means mirrors of mirror or mirror of mirrors. 
Um, this was a repress from Mississippi Records, which is a shop and label in Portland, Oregon, um, which puts out a lot of old world and folk music. Somehow they got their hands on the recordings of this and got the rights. Um, beautiful, extremely sparse. Um, one quote on the back here um, says, Arva, Arva Parrott once said, the instant and the eternity are struggling within us. So <laughs> heavy themes. Um, I'm going to put a link in the description to um, him talking about composing the piece, Dear Alina, uh, but really gorgeous. Uh, this is a single LP, 33 RPM, but really nice uh, foil, foil stamping here and full mm -hmm. color. Interesting uh, painting here. Um, looks sort of religious, that cover, that image from, from a distance, looks a little religious. Are those meteor showers or rays of, oh, rays of Jesus coming down? What's on the cover? It's, it's a painting by a woman named Sarah Culp. I don't know what it is or think, yeah, who knows? I mean, he has sort of some background in like sacred church music, um, some organ stuff and a lot of choral work. So there is kind of that element, spirit, the spiritual element, I guess you could say. Um, I don't think he's like overtly religious, but maybe, maybe someone can correct me. A lot of those uh, minimalist guys at the end of the 20th century um, always, you know, tried to take on some element of like spirituality or zen. Like um, I know uh, John Adams gets really into like uh, Hinduism and his his works, and you know Philip Philip Glass and uh, John Cage and all that. They were all into Buddhism and all that stuff. He really exploded sort of in that scene, the late 90s, early 2000s. I remember picking up some CDs when Tower opened a separate classical store in San Francisco across from their Columbus and Bay store uh, on ECM and on Nonsuch. And, you know, groups like, which I'm going to show later, Kronos Quartet were doing a lot. Of, he got a really kind of known even beyond the classical minimalist uh, uh, audience. Yeah. I just mentioned the ECM new series and, and Arvo Pert is right. the, the main artist, in, one of the main artists in that ECM new series uh, editions. Yeah. There was that one famous uh, C, I forgot the name, the piece that was everywhere for a while. Yeah. Unfortunately, I've never played any of his music. I wish I have, but a lot of this minimalism um, doesn't lend itself to wind instruments very well. It's hard to play the same line over and over again on a wind's instrument and not have the musicians get angry at you. Uh, one thing funny, uh, speaking of the minimalism, and uh, he's, he's talking about uh, the score of Fiorellina, which is the solo piano piece, is only uh, two pages long. And it says the only notation related to the tempo uh, roughly translates to peacefully in an elevated and introspective manner. So there's not really a time signature, just a peaceful tempo. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. All right, Mazzy, what do you have? Well, I'm gonna, this is an extension of my intro uh, talking about pop culture and uh, getting in turn on to this album. Uh, when I was 13 and a half years old, my father took me downtown San Francisco, Cinerama, 70 millimeter, the first week it came out of 2001, A Space Odyssey. Now, first of all, this cover illustration, when you're 13 and a half, 14 year old, and you're into the whole space thing, you just eat this up. You just look through every picture, but, the, this movie opens and closes with the same piece of music with uh, uh, Richard Strauss's, and I'm going to screw this up, but also Sprach Zarathustra. Help me. Also Sprach Zarathustra. Thank you. Kind of a minimal tone poem, but it's one of those pieces of music that has become so iconic and parodied and overused. A little uh, known fact, the version on this album is not the version used in the film until the CD came out, uh, I guess in the 90s, where they got that version of it. But what's interesting about this, I'm thinking I'm 13, 14 years old, and I get turned on to this. Now, of course, uh, uh, one of the most overplayed, you know, lush pieces of music is um, the other Strauss, Johann Strauss, The Blue Danube. We've all heard it. It's lush. It's when the, you know, the positive side of the movie uh, is and they're, the space station, the rockets going to the space station, and it's almost like this whole six-minute piece of music to that. I, my father, when I was in the theater, just loved that because he he's the one that would play things like Respighi's Pines of Rome and, and that very romantic type of music at home. It's only classical music he played. But then there's um, this Georgi Leggetti 
two pieces of music in here, which is very sort of um, almost like progressive avant-garde choral, psychedelic in a way. At the time, this is 1968, I'm listening to psychedelic music. I'm listening to Quicksilver Messenger Service, Jimi Hendrix, play these 12 minute, 15 minute songs. And I hear um, Requiem for Soprano, Mezzo Soprano, Mixed Choir and Orchestra, and um, Lux Aterna. Lux Aterna right now sounds, you know, before you had these uh, Japanese anime type of thing, sounds like a character right out of that stuff. But the mood of those pieces, it's so minimal, it's so psychedelic. I would play this record in my room every night for, for months turned the lights out. Obviously, I was too young. I wasn't smoking pot or anything, but I had a black light. And this album to me was so psychedelic and turned me on to what would later become minimalism and avant-garde, which I'm going to show later too. So I really like, I really like the real melodic and the dramatic classical, like Beethoven or Wagner and stuff. But I really like, like you, like Arvo Part and um, these other minimalists, I got turned on. And, and this record last uh, gave me a lasting impression on classical music. And I think I love the fact that uh, obviously the movie did it. And of course, Kubrick, oh, a little fact, Kubrick used this music when he was doing the rough cut of the album. He had a guy named Alex North score the movie. On the night of the premiere, Alex North thought his music was going to be in the film. He shows up, can you, be, can you imagine as a composer showing up at the premiere and your music is nowhere to be heard? He used all the music. Later, there was a- Did I he think, still get paid though? Uh, well, he got paid, but you know, obviously you don't get paid for sales and performance and pu publishing royalties if your music, it's like a kill fee pretty much, um, if yeah. you know, for that. Can you imagine that? Now, we can't even imagine what this movie would be like with that. Although the Alex North score came out on CD, and I guess in the 90s or 2000s, so you can get that score. I can't imagine it without this, but it, it just made it. But this is like the, the found music he used for the motion picture. You know, I, I heard a story once, I don't know how true it is, but I, I heard that uh, Ligeti himself was not aware that his music was used in the film until years later. He didn't like it, apparently. I, yeah, he was a bit startled. Um, Ligeti is an interesting composer because, uh, you know, you're comparing him to the minimalist, which is funny, he, he, but he's, he comes before them. Right. And his, his music actually shares a lot in common with the, the type of music that was popular in the mid 20th century, which is more modernist, more serialist stuff. And he's in some ways, his music is kind of the bridge between the really uh, kind of intellectual, dissonant, atonal music and the more kind of ethereal stuff that would come later on with like Philip Glass and that kind of that kind of music. Yeah, I think this was written in 60, 60 or 62 that a uh, couple of those pieces there originally. Yeah, I, I had no idea who he was, I mean, before this movie came out, before I heard the soundtrack. So, my choice, I go back a few <laughs> decades, but still one of the popular. Oh, really? Songs. Yeah, <laughs> Four Seasons, Living Stereo Edition, 33 rounds per minute, well-known classical music, you know? I, I I put this out a little on purpose because classical music is not so often in videos from the VC. There is Sound Strange who, who does some classical videos, but somehow it's not that popular and not righteous. I hope I, it's, it's the correct term I use because it's almost sometimes like pop music. And, and, and in, in my little knowledge of classical music, I, co music, I consider uh, uh, this one almost as the first pop music album. Maybe the musicians amongst us can, can say something about that because it's so, so easy to get dragged into it. There also has been reworks from, uh, 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 help me out, um, Max Richter, thank you. A good one, great one, and and this this recording, I, I think has its roots up to in our times. It's it's still very popular. It's it's still out there. Mike, Mike think, mention the mention the composer. We have a couple people who watch. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. It's, it's Vivaldi. We have a couple people have written in on some of these okay. videos. It's hard sorry. to see. Yeah. You know. Okay. 
Vivaldi, obviously, yeah. It's interesting you picked that one because, I mean, I mean yes, but the Four Seasons is, I mean, it's almost to a point where, like, if you're a classical musician and, and you hear the Four Seasons, you just kind of roll your eyes because it's, it's pop music at this point. It's, it's so... Um, like Freebird. Yeah. Rock and roll. Um, it's funny that you would pull out that recording, though, because the way, and, and maybe you're aware of this, the way we, we played music from the uh, 18th century in, at that time when that was recorded in the, the mid 20th century is totally different from the way we'd approach it now. So listening to like older recordings of like Baroque music, like Vivaldi uh, from that time period, from like the living stereo era, um, it's to, to a modern musician, it sounds really dated because the performance practice and the, the scholarship of what we know how to play that music is totally different now. Like I, would, I, would, I haven't heard that particular recording, but I would guess it's quite kind of heavy and big ensemble and the tempos are a little slower, right? What period is that record? Is that 1700s, 1800s? Yeah, Vivaldi was, was in the, the uh, mid 1700s. Okay. Uh, no, early 1700s, sorry. Okay. Recording uh, is from 1960. And that's, that's absolutely true. If you hear that, this version, you already feel, you don't have to know much about classical music. If you hear that, it sounds great, it's beautiful, it's perfection. But nowadays, you won't hear it that way, which is not always uh, better, you know? If I hear Lang Lang and, and it's all about speed, I'm, I'm, I'm not so happy with, with, with that uh, uh, direction uh, they go faster, faster, faster in a way. Isn't like 59 to 60 to maybe 65, 66, the golden age of, of those RCA records when they were put out yeah. like that? Kind of like, again, like Cinerama. That was the age of Cinerama. So it's, it's just because it happened to be, uh, I mean, it was new ground in, in, in recording. Um, right. They and really didn't know what awesome. they're doing. Uh, I mean, they did, but it was all, it was all new. Um, but they were using, you know, pretty much all tube electronics. So they, they, it had its own warmth to it. They were using, you know, tube powered microphones. The miking was very minimal and they were basically recording hall sound. And that's why these recordings from this era sound so natural, especially the, the string tone. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a realism that you just don't get with a, with a recording that has, you know, 80 microphones over the orchestra and, you know, the clarinet solos coming. So you turn up the clarinet. And... Yeah. But actually, yeah. Michael, but I was... That is, that is oh, the, sorry, golden, the golden area of, of the classical recordings, the, the, the mid-50s to the late, late 60s. It's the best it gets. Yeah. I believe that version is the Societa Corelli, which is an Italian ensemble. Is that... I think that's right, yeah. I actually the have... have that's, that's the only version. I have the same version. That's the only one I have of that. Don't shoot me, but I can't say it right now. I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now I know there's a there's a recent vinyl release of a really excellent recording um, by the interpreti uh, Venezia, I believe, uh, on the uh, Chasing the Dragon records. It's a uh, I believe it's direct to disc. It's a uh, direct to disc of this Italian chamber orchestra playing, um, I believe, yeah, it is the Vivaldi Four Seasons. There's two records out. There's a record of them playing assorted chamber music and then a record of them playing the Four Seasons. And um, the sound quality is excellent, but also the performance, if you listen to it, it's gonna be very different from something like that. Um, the, the playing is, this ensemble smaller, the playing is, is more like a, like a historically informed kind of playing. So it's much lighter. All the articulation is much lighter. I think they're playing probably on gut strings. Um, so it's, it's closer to actually what it would have sounded like in Vivaldi's time than, than so having the, the 60s recording. That strings has like a, like a softer, darker timbre to the tonal quality of the strings? Yeah, because in, in the last 50 years or so, there's been, a, there's been a resurgence in not only the popularity of what we call early music, but also um, you know, scholarship on you know, what is historically accurate. Um, because the, the thing about this music is unlike romantic music, music from the 19th century, that orchestras have been playing since it was premiered. It is a continuous line. But some of this other music, like the music of Bach and the music of Vivaldi and all, and all these Baroque composers, their music was premiered and then essentially shelved. And you know, some composers found some Bach manuscripts and were interested in it, but this music has no continuous performance history. 
Hmm. So a lot of learning how to play this type of music is, is actual, there's actual fields of scholarship on it. And that's why you see people now interested in um, reproductions of, of instruments from those era and, and playing the music on the, the type of instruments that they would have been playing back in the 17 or 1600s. I remember that again, working in, in the 70s and Weather Warehouse Records, there was all these series and I, what was it, Archive, uh, ARC, yeah. the Russian or whatever they- It was Deutsche Grammophon's uh, early music label. Arc, and Arc. it was great because I used to get some of those. My, the horror of my music collection has in the mid 90s when I purged a third of my um, uh, vinyl is I got rid of almost all my classical because CDs, Perf better for classical in, in theory and you know you're not things aren't cut you can have longer things there's no clicks with the soft uh, sections but I had a lot of these records uh, recorded on period uh, instruments of the time uh, and uh, those were just so be beautiful they almost seem more acoustic in a way well because they're, they're recording it in in smaller spaces because this music was not meant to be played in big halls it was meant to be played in smaller spaces so a lot of the recordings are very are very open and acoustic and they're recorded in old churches. They're very intimate. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's the, like the good label, line. the good label for that kind of stuff, the, the, the really groundbreaking label that pushed a lot of these early recordings out was um, Telefunken. That's, That's Altos Ver. Right. They did a series, especially the stuff they did with um, Harnencourt, the conductor. Um, you know, it was some of the first recordings ever done on period instruments. It was like rock and roll. These people had, had spent like, four months learning how to play the Baroque oboe and the Baroque flute. And then they said, okay, we're going to record all the Bach cantatas now. Yeah. And, and, and what we also uh, don't have to forget, there is always some Duke or, or Baron or, 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 or high, high person who paid the composer for his entertainment. And when they uh, did the first uh, um, playing of, of, of this uh, uh, work, He's the, the guy sits amongst the musicians. They were around him. And that's the original way they were intended to, to be played, to be heard from the composer. Nobody thinks about that nowadays. We are, we are used to, there's, there are the musicians and we sit here. It was not in the beginning. It was different. Great. Are you ready for round two, second album, MJ? Okay, sure. Um, let's see. What should I pick next? Um, I'm going to continue with picking things that are personally important to me. And uh, this is going to be a surprise for some of you expecting me to pull out something uh, with, you know, stellar sound quality. This is not amazing sound quality, but this is a recording from the 80s on DECA Digital of uh, Charles de Troyes and the Orchestra Symphony Montreal um, playing some Ravel works. Uh, notably the entire Mother Goose ballet, uh, Pavan for a Dead Princess, and uh, probably the biggest oboe piece in the orchestra repertoire, uh, the Tambour de Couperin, which means the Tomb of Couperin. Um, just, so, I mean, this is some of my favorite orchestral music that exists. Uh, Ravel was a brilliant orchestrator. Probably in terms of, of getting colors out of the orchestra, Ravel might have been the best orchestrator who ever lived. Um, and these are, these are some of his shorter pieces. And this recording, the playing level on this recording is uh, probably the, the, the definitive versions of a lot of these pieces. I know Le Tombeau de Couperin, um, which is a notoriously difficult oboe piece, the oboe is featured throughout. Um, it's probably the fastest and the cleanest rendition of this piece that exists today. Um, the, all the soloists on this, uh, my former teacher, Ted Baskin in the Montreal Symphony, he plays solo oboe on this record. Um, another teacher I worked with at McGill, John Zerbel, plays solo horn on Pavan for a Dead Princess. And, you know, despite the fact that I paid $3 for this and it's, it's on kind of early, harsh digital, um, this is a record I just keep coming back to because it's the, the performance is so good. Mm. Were you turned on to that, that piece or that specific album um, from those professors in Montreal? Uh, I had heard of it before, because um, I, I mostly from hearing about people, look, you know, every oboist studies La Tombe de Couperin. It's an orchestral excerpt. You go to any orchestral audition, you're playing La Tombe de Couperin. It's usually the first thing you play. Um, so it's one of those things where every oboist is on their iTunes is going to have like five different recordings of it on there. And um, this, is, this is the fast one. This is the fast recording. 
and say, you wanna, you wanna hear someone playing this at the marked tempo cleanly, um, it's this recording. How much faster is it from other versions? Uh, quite a bit faster. Uh, Cause I mean, the, the piece, the Tambo de Couperin, um, is an interesting piece because it was originally a piano. A lot, Ravel did this a lot. He would write something for piano and make a piano piece and then later you would orchestrate it. Um, so it was originally a piano piece and it was, it's, the name is the Tomb of Couperin, uh, the Tombeau de Couperin. And it's, a, it's kind of an, it's, it's a nod to that old French Baroque style of Couperin in, in uh, the court of Louis XIV. Um, what's interesting about this piece though is that each movement is based on a French dance. Um, so there's the prelude, the forlan, um, the rigadoon, and each movement he named after um, a fallen, a, a friend who died in World War I. Each movement is, well, it's not named after, it's dedicated to. So each movement under the, the title of the French dance has a dedication to one of his friends who, who died in the war. So the, the performance is makes it makes it worth having yeah and the sound quality is i mean it's early digital it's not you know it's not teller quality it's deca digital um but the, like the, it's very metallic sounding they avoided that actually because they recorded it in uh they recorded it in a suburb of montreal in a uh, very well-known church that's well known for acoustic warmth um so they recorded it in a very warm space they didn't record it in the hall um, and so actually it's not a bright recording. It is a little on the analytical side, um, but in terms of like tonal balance, it's not painful to listen to. Now it's not my part of expertise. It's more uh, Michael's from Germany, but do you, have you heard a CD version of that? Uh, I've heard a streaming digital version of it. And I don't think I, I have the CD quality. The whole argument is the vinyl bring in a little, adds a little extra warmth to it. It does. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm sure this though has been remastered and I haven't heard a remastered version of it, but um, funny enough, this, this, uh, this copy I have, I, I bought it in Montreal and I bought it at a, like a, um, I think a street sale and it was the old broadcast copy for the Radio Quebec. Oh, wow. And so this is the broadcast card from all the times it was played on the, on the provincial radio. Wow. That's great. Nice little relic. Yeah. I like finding stuff inside of records. <laughs> That's the best. Michael, Austin. Next for me, this is a 70s um, piece of music from the Polish composer Henryk Gorecki, I guess is how you say it. This is Symphony Number no. 3, um, which I believe is also called the Symphony of Sorrowful Songs. And this is recorded in, I don't know how to say it, K-A-T-O-W-I-C-E, Poland, in the 76, I believe, um, and it's a symphony in three movements, and it has some opera um, featuring the soprano voice of Don Upshaw. Um, so I play music in an ensemble called Balmeray, sort of like instrumental post-rock, you could say, and we did one tour um, with the Japanese band Mono, who's like this kind of loud band. I know Mono. Yeah, Mono's great. Um, we, we actually played with them on a a West Coast tour, so we played in, in Phoenix um, with them. But funnily enough, so every night they would put this on as the house music. So when the doors opened and people were coming in, this was like blasting through the PA and setting up the mood for this kind of like very dark epic music. Um, but that's where I first heard that was from the Japanese band Mono. And this is this was put out by Nunsuch in 2015. Um, it's not like audiophile by any means, but it sounds nice and it's kind of a totem for me from like this old touring uh touring cycle we did but this is a nice one uh if you yeah i'm not it. familiar with the composer at all i do know who don upshaw is but mm -hmm. uh yeah i don't really know much about him either this is the only thing i've really heard um he was born in 33 and died about 10 years ago so this came out posthumously i have that record um, <laughs> on compact disc and i got into this whole mode thing in the again the late 90s through the 2000s and I bought tons of non-such before they started re-signing these elderly statesmen like Randy Newman, Laurie Anderson, uh, Ry Cooter on the non-such label. Of course, it had been a um, budget classical label subsidiary of Electra Records um, and some sort of 
field recordings of international music back in the you know the 70s and everything in the 60s but they did a lot of avant-garde music a lot of 20th century music like obviously like john adams uh nixon and china the whole that, that whole thing and uh people like obviously scott johnson and um even zorn uh what's his name john zorn john zorn the, i really would buy these records because of the covers too the covers were very modern very unlike classical record covers at the time use of a lot of great uh minimalist photography a lot of full bleed type things um and i just i just love to me that's a very wonderful graphic cover i love that it's, it's kind of somber music um yeah not very upbeat, but it has like this beautiful warmth very lush wintry kind of feeling that's you know, nice. all right mazzy okay i'm going with to me i who i think is again from my point of view my knowledge one of the most innovative 20th century composers russian composer so maslov does russian and i'm going with uh, igor stravinsky i just love this cover him at it's a great 1960 cover. Uh, this is his record, one of his uh, recordings, one of the versions that he conducted. Oh, I'm going to say the English version, The Ride of Spring. And someone say it in French for me. Or the, it's not the I can pronounce it right. Home. Yeah, totally. In fact, uh, this is from uh, 1913. This was originally recorded. The whole idea, it was uh, presented uh, on the Champs <coughs> Elysees originally when um, it was a ballet and orchestral piece. And there was almost like a mini riot, supposedly. And there's all these different discussions and theories. Were they rioting because of the music, or was it was because of the ballet, or is it because of the, the theme of the pagan uh, theme of the of the perform of the ballet? Um, Stravinsky stuff is very almost like I guess early mo modern avant-garde, very rhythmic. Uh, he uses a sort of Russian folk music uh, influences in this and it was really a, a totally different piece of the time and i got i didn't get into it until again i first heard this in the 70s work someone put it on in the in the store and it was just it was a little different than all the traditional stuff again and i just thought it was great i love this cover i think it's very graphic there's a great uh, cd that they put out version of this on its 100th anniversary in 2013 columbia masterworks I think it adds two different versions of him conducting this. So it's not just this LP, it's a, a one other one, as well as a version of his uh, Firebird Suite. But I just think he's an important artist. Again, that le led me, I went backwards, but got into the avant-garde a little bit and out there music, which I really prefer uh, quite a bit. A little challenging maybe, but I played it again yesterday and it just didn't seem, didn't seem very odd to me anymore at all, but I think it's beautiful. Great cover. Look at that picture of him. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a, it's Stravinsky was always at the, at the fort, always at the cutting edge. I mean, this, when this premiered in 1913 and in, in, a, in a lot of ways it was the ushering in of the modernist era, both in terms of society and art. I mean, it was right on the cusp of world war one and that's really when art and music were never the same again. Um, it's funny that you pulled out that recording because I don't know a single classical musician that likes that recording. <laughs> That's why I'm not a classical musician. Because you know. Stravinsky was a brilliant composer and not um, the majority. And uh, I, I mean, really, like all his music is just, ge I think he's a genius, um, but he was a terrible conductor. And he didn't like a lot of, his, of the other people doing his work either, apparently. Um, I think even, but I think I remember reading an interview where even Stravinsky acknowledged that his, his own recordings were kind of garbage. Um, cause the, the, it was funny is the orchestra is playing very well for him because it's the composer. Um, but the, the, it, you know, he, he can't keep the orchestra together at times for this piece. I really like, um, that's punk. Yeah. Well, it, it kind of, that's kind of the point of the spring, though, is, is you need someone giving the right beats to the podium because the entire world is counting. There's nothing that, like, uh, technically, I've played it. It's, there's nothing that technically difficult in the piece. It's just, can you count? Can you count the polyrhythms? It's very um, rhythmic. It's very rhythmic. Maybe that's why rock and roll people kind of gravitate to it, because it's got those rhythms uh, in a way. I don't, who knows? I don't know. Michael, what do you think? 
Michael, who's answering? Austin, <laughs> musically, do you know? I'm not familiar with, with, with that music. Check it out. I will. I, I, of course, I only know the rights of Spring, which is coined the very first emo band, which was Guy Pichotto from Fugazi. Um, I love the rights of Spring. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I wonder where they got that name. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, for the right, for the right, right of Spring, this piece of music, uh, I wonder, are there, are there other versions, MJ, that you know are like more like definitive or widely known? Well, it's, it's one of the most recorded pieces of music in the repertoire. I mean, there's so many recordings of it, and a lot of them are very, very good. Uh, I don't have it here. The, there's two that I really like. So um, most of the same players that are on, on that Stravinsky version, because the Columbia Symphony was more or less the, uh, I, I believe that was recorded in New York. So I, I The label, sure. it's, label sim it's like the house symphony in a way, right? But there's two Columbia symphonies, really. Yeah one of which is contract people from the New York Phil, and one of which is contract people from the Los Angeles Symphony. Um, depends where they were recording it. Because the ones with Bruno Walter and the Columbia Symphony were done in LA, but I think the, Str I think the Stravinsky ones were done in New York. But um, there's a great version of, I think the same people, the New York Philharmonic playing it with Bernstein on the early Columbia label. That's that been reissued. That would have been New York recording also at, the, at, 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 CB, at Sony or at- Yeah. Um, uh, so Leonard Bernstein, the New York Phil, and I believe that was reissued by Impex, and I have the Impex reissue. It's, it sounds better than the original. That's probably mid '60s, early to mid '60s. Early '60s, yeah. and then, um, and then another really great one, especially for sound quality, is the Georg Schulte and Chicago uh, one on Decca in the '70s. And mm -hmm. it both there's a speaker's corner version, and the original version is affordable. Um, 20 bucks. I think, I think, maybe this is way off base from a musician's point of view, musicians, but a Bernstein, his score, one of my favorite scores of, of his is his score for West Side Story. And there's a lot of influences of that type of, the little, the jagged part, but the different rhythms that he uses. Yeah, he makes it count. Yeah, exactly. Well, the whole dance thing too, with Jerome Robbins and all that. So I'm a huge West Side Story fan. I know that's going from classical music to the Broadway, but I, it, it, it's basically it, classical. Yeah, well, especially, and that to me is the best use of it, the best collaborative. And Michael, you, in Germany, you have a, a version of this as well on vinyl. Yeah, I have an, I have an Everest version, the 45 round per minute analog Everest version, and um, the sound quality is astonishing good. Very oh, is that, the, is that the one with uh, uh, Gusen's conducting? Yeah, the green one, you know, beautiful cover. Yeah. Is I'm, it in your vault? I, pardon? Is it in your vault or do you have it handy? You don't have it handy. I have it handy, Messi. I have it handy. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't. We have a running joke about a couple of records that are very rare that he keeps in his vault. And I remember we did our first collaboration. I said, you got a friggin' vault? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, you showed that. I love that. Beautiful Be cover. Beautiful color, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that still available? It is available, but easy. You can get it over a 55. Acoustic box. sounds, yeah. yeah. Uh, they have a double 45 yeah. of it. Okay. Beautiful version to go. What's your next one, Michael Ludwig? No, I have another one. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to availability, electric recording company. Yeah. <laughs> Schubert, I can't it's read it. Sonatina number, thir number three in G minor, play played by Johanna Marzi and Jean Antonietti. And, and I put this one out because this is a good example to talk about the collectability of, of classical records, of, of original pressings. If you consider some of those uh, Blue Note originals, pricey or expensive, look for some of, of the classical uh, uh, original pressing. It's sometimes, it's unbelievable. It's always it's chamber music too. Yeah, you're right. And, and they go around three, four, five thousand euros is not that rare. It's, it's unbelievable if you can get them. For a few, yeah. Yeah, for, for a few, of course, not, 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 they are not legion in that price range. But they are, for example, originals of this one. It's, it's 
so hard to get. And, and uh, also the problem again, those are old recordings. If you buy an original pressing, it's 50 years old and, and doesn't sound that hot, I, I think. So again, in my opinion, an electric recording company did a great job with this one because this sounds fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, everybody says it's, it's, it's insane to put out a record which goes for 300 British pounds initially, but compare it to an original pressing and, and then it looks a little different. A little different. And those are made in London? Those are made in London, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I still have never heard one. I want to. Yeah. We need to have a yeah. listening party if COVID ever ends. Through, through the internet, <laughs> you know. But Messi, um, what do you think about those cover art? Well, this we were talking art? when you showed the Sam records, what I got attracted to it. It almost looks like it. I know it's different. It almost looks like it's silkscreen, but I don't think that is. Um, no. No. Yeah, I, I like it. You know, it fits a certain type of music. Um, I was the original cover like that, I assume? Exactly. It's an yeah. exact yeah. Uh, a reproduction of the uh, 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 original cover. It's a very scholarly cover. It's, mm -hmm. you know, with a little sort of uh, filigree thing of that, uh, you know, almost, I keep thinking of a graduation tie. It's not that, but a little thing on the end. You know, I love the EMI logo. I've loved that, you know, from the UK point of view, that... Uh, that world logo, it's very a timely, a timeless logo from the 50s and 60s for EMI records. I mean, I, when I went to London with the whole Beatle time, and the, that is a whole old EMI Parlophone stuff. Uh, I just love that. I mean, in fact, Parlophone came from the classical side. We were talking earlier before we got on here, uh, MJ playing the oboe, and I was telling him that, you know, George Martin, my Beatle connection again, was an oboe player. That was his sort of primary instrument. Uh, but that and that comes from the whole EMI house and uh, the corporate thing of London and the B, aside from the BBC. It's a nice, it's a great classic cover. It's not like great design, but it's a it's a cover of its time. And right. I think it's great they didn't try to modernize it. You know, the worst thing to do is when they try to, especially in the '80s, when they tried to do this '80s style thing of, of records later, it was to me atrocious, garbage. That's beautiful. <laughs> I have a question for our musicians. We have two musicians today. Um, when, I, when I hear this Schubert records, um, it feels so modern. It, it doesn't feel like old music. Is that a personal thing or, or is there some, some, really some points when I say it sounds modern to me, it doesn't sound old? Hmm. I have no clue. So this is a duet, and there's two other ver there's two other issues of also Schubert music in this from the label. Interesting. I'm I'm not familiar with the mu with the music on that on that pressing. Um, yeah, I, I I I don't know those pieces. I know there's a ton of Schubert chamber music, and the, the string players kind of have free reign on that music. It's it's their bread and butter. Um, I mean the the especially like chamber music. Uh, what was going on in Germany at this time? This music was being composed against the backdrop of kind of the social upheavals of like the 1830s and the 1840s. And, and then we have the, the Spring of Nations in 1848. Um, so both Schumann and Schubert were kind of writing of, during this kind of intellectual renaissance that was putting forth all these liberal ideals. And the problem is the government that, the government, especially in the, the local governments in Germany at that time were very they censored a lot of art and music at that time. So even though we have these symphonies from Schubert and Schumann, the really interesting music at that time is the chamber music that they were playing in salons. These, these you know, uh, upper middle class or bourgeoisie uh, people in these communities would, would just have private concerts in their homes for each other um, because there was a, what could be played in the concert hall at that time was um, very conservative. So it's 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 uh, avant-garde music of their time. Of their time, yes. Wow, great. This is a history lesson, folks. We're learning here. Yeah. Yes, this is. It, there's going to be a you know, a test on this video, after. So, <laughs> what is your third record you want to share with us? My, Michael and Phoenix. Uh, what's your oh, third? Your third. Okay. Record? 
So uh, let's see, what should I pick? Uh, let's do an opera record. Uh, so let's have more history. Um, so a lot, I, opera seems to be the most under collected thing in, in classical music. Like people are given opera records away. Um, and I tend not to collect full sets of an opera. Like I, I, I can't sit down and just listen to an entire opera. That's not, it, it's too, if you're not watching it, it's just too long and it's, it's too much. Exactly. But I love, I love opera highlight records. And my favorite opera highlight record is one of the best performances. And this, this actually, the full version of this is on the Harry Pearson TAS list. This is uh, Herbert von Karajan conducting uh, Mussorgsky's Boris Goodenough. Do any of you know this opera? I do. You do? Oh, okay. I, I, saw it, I saw it in San Francisco, the San Francisco Opera. Ah. Do you know which version you saw? <laughs> The San Francisco Opera doing it, but uh, I don't know which version. I there was a period of time where I I got free opera tickets, and the San Francisco Opera is amazing. The staging, everything. It's it's you know I again like you. I know the highlights of of certain things. Everything from Wagner to the, the Italian uh, operas, the German operas, and um, but going for the spectacle. You know, where I was way up in the nosebleed seats at the opera house, but I don't know which version. But it, it's stupendous. It is like four hours, five hours. Yeah, uh, depending on the version. Yeah, uh, I actually did a did a paper in my undergrad on this opera. And what's interesting is, so you guys know Mussorgsky probably vaguely, right? He wrote, you know, pictures at an exhibition, and um, he, he was the first. Emerson. I think he played with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer too, or something. <laughs> um, he was the first real Russian composer uh, in the 19th century, uh, and but. It, when I say that, I, I don't mean that there weren't Russian composers beforehand, but they were kind of, the Russian aristocracy was very much trying to be Europe at the time. And, and they were very disconnected from the rest of the Russian populace and, and like Russian folk traditions because the, the monarchs in Russia, I mean, Catherine the Great was German. Like all these monarchs were, were not Russian. Um, and so a lot of the music they were playing was imitations of the German and Italian styles that were importing over. And Mussorgsky was one of the first people to really compose in a Russian style and develop a really Russian school of, of music. Um, he was also a raging alcoholic, and that's why most of the music we have from him is unfinished. Um, he, just, he just couldn't get away from the vodka. Um, this opera is his only finished opera. He left a couple other unfinished ones. It's the only one that com was completed. It was revised twice due to censorship from the, from the Tsar. Um, and after that, Rimsky-Korsakov, who wrote Scheherazade, uh, revised a new version of it with this kind of takes away some of the Russianness, in my opinion. And that's the version that was played for most of the 20th century is the Rimsky-Korsakov version. And this is the Rimsky-Korsakov version. Nowadays, if it's performed, they almost all go back and do the original Mussorgsky version because it sounds more like Mussorgsky. Um, but... Makes sense, yeah. But yeah, this is probably the best recording of the Rimsky-Korsakov version. Shostakovich also did a version too, but um, that one never got popular. Is that an illustration or a photograph? Can you hold it close? It's a painting. And so the opera of Boris Godunov is, uh, is a history opera. It's based on an actual right. czar in Boris Godunov who usurped the Russian throne by murdering the uh, young toddler uh, czar-to-be and then was himself murdered in a coup by a pretender. What a beautiful um, so he's, yeah. he's kind of a controversial figure, especially uh, when this was composed, when the czars were still in power. It was seen as kind of a controversial move to write a, a czar as a villain. Uh, this is the Mussorgsky picture, picture that an exhibition. Yeah. Which, which um, Mussorgsky never orchestrated. He only wrote the piano version. Hmm. Uh, that, is, that version is orchestrated by the best orchestrator, Ravel. <laughs> but the cover of, of this opera was outstanding. Uh, I love yeah. that cover. Yeah. It's an actual, I believe it's an actual old painting of the Boris Goodenough, who was a real, you can go on Wikipedia and look him up. He was a real guy. Mm -hmm. Wild. Um, I'm going to bring it back to North America for a moment. Um, we're going to Toronto, Ontario, Glenn Gould, Pianist, this is the complete uh, Bach keyboard concertos. Um, 
I found out about Glenn Gould, again, I'm very new to classical music and classical uh, pressings, but this is a book that I picked up uh, called Conversations uh, Absolutely on Music, Murakami talking to the conductor Seiji Ozawa, and essentially what it is is a series of conversations of them putting on a piece of music, a record, uh, either that Ozawa conducted or someone else, and they just talk about the different versions. And so as I was reading it, I would just on my Spotify, sitting in front of my stereo, and I would pull up whatever they were talking about and listen to it while I was reading them talking about it. So I learned a lot about uh, music. This is actually really fun. Even if you, I, did, I didn't know anything about classical music at the time in terms of, but. Check I have to read that. that. I haven't, I have never read that. It's super fun. Uh, it's real, real quick. Um, but it's kind of, I think it's over three or four conversations. But they talk about Glenn Gould at, at some point. Um, so I've started listening to it and really liked it. Um, and if you're familiar, I read a little bit about him. He's kind of a bizarre dude. Um, from Toronto, he had extremely poor posture. He was always kind of stooped over his, the keyboard. Um, this is the Speaker's Corner 3LP box set of all the box stuff he did. I, I have that one. It's, it's yeah. great. It's wonderful. Um, but for, the, for those uh, who are into the piano, piano world, this might be up your alley as a good I start. think. I think Glenn Gould, uh, you know, I might be wrong, but I think he was somewhere on the autism spectrum. Um, he, was, he was a very odd person. And in a lot of his recordings, especially, you know, he has that really, he has two really famous, he recorded the Goldberg Variations twice, and that's what he's most famous for. He had the early one, which I prefer, and then the later one. And the later one, he would do this thing where he'd play and he'd like sing and talk while he's playing. And so you can hear that on the recording. You can hear him kind of mumbling to himself while he's, while he's playing the Goldberg Variations. And I know for those of back to the ECM stuff and Keith Jarrett also kind of did that kind of mumbling, getting into so into the music that he's kind of like auto, making auditory noises. Cone concert, yes. What he's playing. Um, I highly recommend um, for those of you who want a little entertainment while you listen to your Glenn Gould, 32 short films about Glenn Gould is a fantastic film. It's about a 90 minute, nine, hour and 45 minute film of these literally short 32 short films. This actor, Canadian actor, I forgot his name, you've seen him once you see the film, portrays Glenn Gould into each of these performances. I have a compact disc of that, so that's sort of my introduction. I have a couple of, again, all my Glenn Gould is on compact disc, but watch that movie, uh, Michael, 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 and uh, ch check it out because it, it is really interesting. You know, you, you, the only bad thing about a movie like that is I saw it in the theater, and if you're a little restless, you start thinking, okay, I'm at number 14, I got 16 to go. But if you get back that, you, you, know, you get your vaping, whatever you do, Michael, have a little cocktail, have water, whatever you're, uh, and let, sit back and watch that. And it's, it's an extremely enjoyable film and a great little sampler uh, CD. I don't think it's on vinyl, but I wish it would be. It's great. 32 short films. I think it's 32, it could be 36, but I think it's 32. Cool. What, what do you have Mazzy for us? Okay, mine's a twofer because you know how Mazzy cheats all the time. And I'm only doing that because of the cover. I'm going to Angel Records. Um, totally different artists. I'm going French and German here. So I'm going with Kurt Weill and Eric Satie. Eric Satie. Um, Eric Satie is very um, sort of late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, what I, I picked this partly, the, both these, because of the illustrations, uh, the artwork on the cover. Uh, the uh, Kurt Weill is illustrated by a guy named uh, George Gross, who was a famous uh, German caricaturist. And I loved how the art director, uh, these are from the 70s, I believe, uh, use this on the cover of this series. So there's a whole series by different composers that are very similar style-wise in terms of the typeface and the illustration. What's great about this, the original cover, the, this original illustration, not as a triptych, but the singular version, uh, this is a Picasso uh, pencil drawing. And I just love this. Um, Eric Satie, you know, with, with, with befriended at the time, you know, in, in, um, in uh, Debussy and, and Ravel later and worked with them a little, I didn't really work with them, but was part of that whole thing. But uh, again, I'm gonna screw up the name, but uh, Trois Gimopedes, Anybody help me there? Uh, yeah. That means I just, I just always say Jimnopedy. Okay. I, I might be wrong. I'm wrong. My French I'm is not good. You, if this is going to you on this grid here, I'm, he, 
what he said, what MJ says goes. Absolutely. That piece of music you've heard in commercials, or it was used in feminine hygiene commercials. It's used in soundtracks, Woody Allen. I am, I am very sick of the Every, It's one of those overplayed pieces of music. It's a gorgeous piece of music, but you know, there's certain classical pieces. Probably we had a joke in the um, 70s, because uh, there's an FM rock station and the rock stations would start playing Pachelbel's Canon and D. And so there was a whole thing, you're a prisoner of Pachelbel because you would, you know, every person would come in and want a, want a copy of Pachelbel's Canon in D. Um, but I, I love this. It's, it's, it's kind of romantic. It's a little impressionistic. Um, in terms of um, Kurt Weill, some classical people think he's too pop because he wrote Three Penny Opera with Berthold Breck, um, another, um, well, a writer, a novelist, a poet, and Three Penny Opera, you know, and that kind of music made famous things like Whiskey Song, known to most rock people as Alabama Song that the Doors did. A lot of people didn't know that that's not a Doors song, that's a Kurt Vile song. But the, and also Mac the Knife, if you know Mac the Knife, uh, Kurt Vile, and, um, and uh, obviously Amer uh, English lyrics written way later for the Bobby Darren version and beyond. But um, I'm throwing these in again, mainly because of the cover, Angel Classics. Again, I got to know these because they were in the same bin because Angels, remember that Schwann catalog, you'd have to have it by Schwann catalog number, not by Kurt Vile or um, Eric Satie. So that's my pick. Are there, are there UK EMI versions of those? Because Angel was the subsidiary, the US subsidiary of EMI. Right, you know, I don't know the answer to that because I'm in, obviously in the States we had Capitol Records, Angel Records, and they had, you know, uh, EMI, Parlophone, because uh, the angel know. stuff, the angel stuff, just the, the 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 difference between the U.S. angels and the U.K. pressings is is a world away. Oh, the pressings were uh, terrible in America at that time. I mean, Columbia. I mean, I don't want to you know pull things up from Michael in Germany, but knowing this, what we got, we'd get returns and things. You know, everyone we'd sell, push them to uh, DGG Deutsche Deutsche Grammophon. It was always a dollar more list price than uh, everything else. People wanted, you know, either the budget label. So those were like a 698 list. Uh, the uh, Angels, Columbia Masterwork were 598 list. And then you got Nonsuch, Seraphin, all those were like 398 lists. And, you know, you'd buy records at a dollar off the list price at then. I, I don't want to get too technical, but to, someday maybe we'll do a conversation of retail records and selling records at the height of the record thing. But um, yeah, the pressings of these were atrocious. Deutsche Grammophon were great. Angels were eh, eh. RCA actually. Well, it's because they, did, they didn't have the, t I mean, uh, the vinyl quality may be one thing, but it's because they didn't have the tapes in the US. So right. Like, like DECA, London DECA, yeah, I mean, all tape. the records were pressed in England. The Londons were pressed in England, just like the DECAs. Right. But, but the Angel stuff, they would send copy tapes over, EMI would send copy tapes over the US. And I, I don't even know what kind of equipment setup they had, but it must've been terrible because I've never listened to an Angel record that wasn't unbearable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know about the mastering and that whole thing, and that's something someone else might be able to chime in on. I have no idea. I was going to mention, uh, Michael, in Germany, you might be interested in this, the minimal ambient world of music. There is a, a composer named Philip Korner who did a few pieces of Sati, and the release is called Sati Slowly, and he basically plays it at like a third of the normal tempo. It's <laughs> already slow. <laughs> And I guess it's sort of, I mean, it's just a full gimmick, but it's, it's be fun. It's like very meditative, like, you know, minimal drone almost music. It's kind of funny. I think I, I showed two albums that the classical geek in our midst, midst here hates or, or that. Well, no, I mean, the music is, the music is wonderful though. I mean, Kurt Vile, I think Kurt Vile is so um, special just because he's one of the few links we have to like the, the Weimar uh, German culture that was this huge artistic flourish in the 1920s in Germany that we just, like a lot of people never made it out of. Yeah. And he was influenced by Mahler and Stravinsky as well too. You wouldn't really hear it in the music, but uh, that's, you know, interesting stuff. Next. Dusseldorf man. Okay. Another Everest. One what reason I put it, that one is of course, because of the cover, <laughs> outstanding cover, I think. And I have, it's Coro 
Bori. It's 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 Hinastera, right? Pardon? It's Hinastera, right? This is Hinastera music. Yeah, and it 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 uh, has it's a ballet and goes with the Aborigine culture. And and what what strikes me about at least about this pressing, it's in classics, uh, classic record, and. I've never heard in classical recalling which which such an outstanding dynamic. It's, the dynamic of this recalling is 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 ridiculous. It's gorgeous. it's because they were they were recorded instead of recorded being recorded on regular like a half inch tape or whatever they were recorded on film stock. Mm -hmm. so we have those thirty five millimeter. Yeah, and and. If you want to to go into the dynamic capabilities of your Haifa equipment, this is the one to go. It's it's, it's outstanding. Really is that outstanding. the is that the forty five? No, it's a thirty three. It's it's ah, that's the one I have. Yeah, a, a relatively old one from classic records. It's not from analog productions. And uh, I have to learn that you have to be a bit careful with the classic records releases of these Everest uh, 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 stuff. Some are outstanding, like this one, but some are not good, not good. So be careful. A lot of them, a lot of them are drilled off center. I've had a lot of classic records in the yeah, tone arm does that, this. That is the case, and and also simply not 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 so good. The, just the, the overall sound quality isn't that good. But this one is outstanding. And, and I know this really composer is John Entil, who's Australian. Is this yeah. is, I'm not familiar with his work. Is this his, one of his most well-known um, productions here? Pardon? Is, is this one of his most well-known pieces? Or I don't know how well-known it is, but uh, uh, it's a it's gorgeous recording. And, and, and very, very, very specific, very nice. And, and how, 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 shall I, how can I put it? It's, it's a little off. It's not what you expect from a classical recording. Okay, it's ballet music, but still very surprising, very nice listening. It's conducted by uh, 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 Eugene Gosens uh, uh, with the London Symphonic Orchestra, this version, and, and quite interesting. That cover reminds me of exotic covers like Les Baxter, the mm -hmm. face masks things, or Martin Denny, uh, that whole, uh, you know, what people call bachelor pad lounge music, tiki music. It's very similar. Great. And you mentioned, so that, you, mentioned choice. That, you mentioned that record also in one of your previous. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll need to I'll need to go back and listen to that because I have it and I haven't listened to it in like two years <laughs> and I should I should uh, bring it back yeah, up. Listen and, and 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 look or hear the dynamic. It's it's yeah. great. Especially because yeah, my system's improved in that time, so I'll... you gotta test it out. Yeah. What, what's next? What's next from you, MJ? Okay, uh, what should I do? Uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll bring in something that I know that nobody here knows, unless you've watched my videos. Um, I do. This is a uh, DECA album. Well, it's actually London. Um, this is the Third Symphony of Albrecht Mignard, conducted by Ernst Ansermé, Orchestra Swiss Roman. I mean, if you collect DECA records, everyone knows Ansermé and Swiss Roman. It's the orchestra he helped found. And he was like, you know, most of the early rare decas are Anser May recordings. This one's a little later, it's from 69. Um, they marketed it as Anser May Memorial album because it, he died a couple years later. Um, but Albert Mignard is I think one of the most underrated classical composers of the Romantic era. Uh, not enough people really know who he is. Uh, his music is great if, you're, if you like Bruckner, um, but he was a Frenchman. And uh, so a lot of people call him the French Bruckner because he kind of composed in that very like Wagnerian, Bruckerian style, but with a little bit of French Impressionism sprinkled in. And uh, he's, I think, most well known because uh, he's kind of a folk hero in France because uh, in, uh, he died in World War I. Uh, and he didn't die fighting in the war. He died because one day he was at his home in the countryside and he saw German soldiers marching over the horizon. And he, uh, in his bright idea, decided that he uh, was going to shoot at them from his house. <laughs> um, right. And uh, so he did that. And then the German soldiers came to his house and burned it down with him inside it. And that was the end of Albrecht Mignard. But um, 
his his third and fourth symphonies are, I think, are masterpieces. Uh, I've played some of his chamber music. He has a really great uh, quintet for piano and winds. That's that's wonderful and an un, kind of an uncovered gem in the repertoire. And this Munyard symphonies, this three and four, they've been only been recorded like three times. Um, they're they're very much underplayed and underrecorded. But I suggest giving them a listen um, because. They're very, uh, you ever have music that you feel is, is kind of like cinematic, like you get landscapes um, when you listen to it. Um, I, I do that with, with Mignard. It reminds me of like the scenes in Lord of the Rings almost. How, how is the availability of, of this uh, edition? This record can be had, especially if you go for the London version. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's an edition three, so it's, a, it's still a wide band, but it's, um, it's not, they're not the narrow band yet, but it's not a deep green pressing. Um, I think I got this for about five dollars, and if you want to get the Deca one, which has a much nicer cover, well, you're looking. If you're in America, maybe like thirty bucks. So it's not it's not hard to find. It's not expensive. It's just it's just underappreciated music that most people aren't familiar with. So Michael Michael can get it cheaper in Germany probably. Yeah. yeah. Great. Wonderful. Thanks for that tip on that one. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'm gonna do next. Oh, let's see. This is. Yano uh, Starker, yeah, yeah, um, the Dvorak, um, with Dorati composing LSO. Um, this is the double forty-five from Analog Productions. Um, I'm a sucker for cello, especially solo cello. So when I found the music of uh, Starker, kind of fell in love. Um, I kind of snoozed and I missed that the, so the solo cello suites, the box box set that was recently put out. Is it not available anymore? No, it's all out of stock everywhere. Oh no! Um, yeah, uh, this is a really nice, really nice pressing. This is also available on thirty. Yeah, here you go. This is what we're talking about. This is all. Yeah. Oh, wow. Great. Um, this is beautiful recording. Again, this is. Um, Starker was. I read a funny story about him that he was about to perform a solo concert, and he was a huge smoker. And he was about to go on stage, and uh, the promoter or whoever was running the stage, you know, said, you know, you can't smoke back here. And he always had a ceremonial cigarette right before he went on, and they, you know, he's he's like, "F you, I'm not playing," and walked out, didn't play. <laughs> um, but this is a really great recording and beautiful, beautiful pressing um, from Analog Productions. There's, I think, a lot of his work um, has been pressed by Speakers Corner. And uh, of course, this beautiful box set that also was pressed from Speaker's Corner and then on 45 RPM from Analog Productions. But beautiful cello music. Um, there, there is also, uh, uh, from the Bach edition, there is also uh, an edition from Electro Recording Company. But maybe you don't ask me where I have it. <laughs> it's kept under lock and key. No. I, I, I live with a cellist, so we listen to a lot of cello recordings here. And, and um, whenever we listen to Starker, he always comments. Um, Star Starker's thing was he was just technically perfect. I mean, I, his, his technique on the fretboard is just so clean. So all, all of his music just it is probably the best version technically of, of something you're going to see. Like his, his box stuff is just flawless. Um, it's not the most musically inventive in the world, but it's just, it's just so relentlessly perfect and shiny. And yeah, he has this huge sound. I mean, his tone production is just gigantic. I think in that time, uh, or this time, it was all about technique, wasn't it? That's, that's what they, they were going for, the technique to be perfect, in a way. Not, not correct? Uh, I don't know about that, because, I mean, in general, the, the standard of technique, I think, across classical music has uh, risen. So um, actually, I'm more used to now, like as a modern performer, going back and listening to older recordings and being like, whoa, they got away with that. Like, mm. um, whereas, whereas some of the stuff that, that is in those old recordings, they would never get away with in a modern recording. Um, it, it's, it's, it, the standards of perfection are, are too high now. Great. Mazzy, what's up? Uh, in 1976, during one of my times working in record stores we we get the promo guys coming in and of course everyone would clamor for the whatever the hit of the day was and and i wasn't a classical wonk by any stretch of the imagination but there were certain records that 
when they, he brought the box out, we try to grab things. Occasionally we can get doubles, but I got this copy, this promo piece, and I didn't know who George Crumb was. Um, boy, was I, was I surprised, pleasantly surprised, but again, going back to uh, the 2001 soundtrack, out there, almost like kind of, I don't want to, I want to say like the Captain Beefheart, of, but it's not really like that at all. John Cage, the minimalist, avant-garde composer, uh, still have this copy. This is a piano piece, uh, three volumes of this record. This is volume two. This is George Crumb, uh, Macrocosmos, and it's uh, Signs of the Zodiac. Uh, this is volume two. I do not have volumes one or volumes three, piano. And what's interesting about George Crumb, I'm, first of all, uh, an illustrator, a pretty popular illustrator of the 70s, Andy Engel did the uh, illustration. And I really kind of like that illustration. It almost looks cosmic. Uh, it is looking cosmic, but it's also the score of uh, this. And of course, those of you who uh, can read notation and read, read this will know what I'm talking about. Uh, promo copy, uh, Columbia Masterworks. Now, George Crumb, this piece of music is piano based by Robert Miller on piano. But like, like people like John Cage too, you don't just play a piano with your hands on the keyboards. You use mallets on the strings. You kick it. You, you throw things at it. It's kind of like, again, I've talked to this on my channel. I'm a fa fan of conceptual artwork, of the Flexus movement, uh, Yoko Ono, and, and Minimalist, and Avant-Garde, and, and, and I just love the idea of this. This kind of music drives some people bonkers. I could put this on and people leave the room, which is great, because if you want to, you know, end a party, you put this kind of shit on and people say, what the, <laughs> I don't want to swear on this particular video, um, but it's, it's out there. It's, it's, there's voices, it's, oh, you're doing weird kind of, you know, you see where Yoko got her thing too, in a way. Um, so I think it's kind of fabulous. Um, and it has, this has like Cancer, Sagittarius, Pisces, Gemini. I'm not going to name the actual pieces of music, but each one represents a, 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 the, a sign of the Zodiac. So um, 1976, this came out, I suppose it's a 1974 or five recording. And I'm going with George Crumb, who's not everyone's cup of tea. Do you know, is, is that, uh, are these pieces for prepared piano? Prepared in, what does that mean? Oh, hey, do you not do you not know what that is? Because a lot of this, a lot of the strange sounds you're probably hearing on piano might be from a prepared piano, tuned a certain way or what? So uh, John Cage actually com came up with this. Um, so it's essentially you take a piano and you open up the lid, and to get certain sounds, it's on certain strings you'll do things like put a screw and washer on two strings, oh. or yeah. put put uh, like uh, uh, laundry clips on one to mute it. And so you basically, you not just have a piano that has notes on it, but some of the notes make specific sounds. I don't know the answer to that. It wouldn't surprise me by listening to some of it. What I do like, there's a note here and it says, this is great. The piano sound in morning music has been modified considerably and the listener should not think that the recording is defective in any way. <laughs> That's subjective. Yeah. One I don't know the answer to that, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I didn't. I was going to bring in, but I didn't think the cover was great. The, the Columbia box set, which I also bought in the '70s, which is not like this, but of Harry Parch. I'm a fan uh, of uh, the composer who basically invented and built his own instruments. Uh, that's for another time, another place. But I, again, I love this kind of stuff. I, I want to learn more about it. I know I like it, and I, I, I'm kind of amused when I put it on and people hate it, not that I'm trying to piss people off, but I expect it. And it, I'm, I'm, it's again, like conceptual art in the MoMA, you go there and you see something and people say, oh, I could have done that. What is that? They're, they have no talent, you know. But you didn't. But you didn't. Jackson Pollock, Splatter, you didn't do it. Yoko Ono, John Cage, you know, one minute of silence. You didn't, um, but I, I love, the concept of it sometimes and sometimes the concept of it may be more important than the actual results so if if you're into that kind of of music i recommend Merzbau. oh i love Merzbau. Yeah. jeff you can, jeff you can listen to this all the time but at the right time to me this is lonely music because i don't many don't know many people that i can sit and listen to listen to it with so 
I, I like the the co uh, collaboration records Merzbow does with different bands. Like, uh, have you ever? So, if you listen to Merzbow, have you heard his his stuff with some of these like uh, like Western like metal bands? No, I haven't. I haven't. I I just have a few Merzbow records, and honestly, that's enough. <laughs> it's difficult <laughs> check, to check out. To that. Check out the, the stuff that Mars built. He's done two records now with a with a uh, American power violence band called Full of Hell, okay. and it's fant fantastic. I'm sure George Crumb influenced bands like Sonic Youth. You know the noise, the whole noise okay. thing. I mean, it, it's it's a net. I mean, I I don't study that. I like a lot of that stuff, but you know the lineage is definitely there. God, we sound so smart here, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> but I want to go uh, just because it has something to do with Dusseldorf. Um, to back to the prepared piano thing. There is a famous musician. It's called. He's called, and I think Michael in Texas knows him because he's a colleague. In quite a, a genre overlaps to his music. He's called Hauschka, and he does a lot of uh, these prepared piano stuff. He has some records out on Deutsche Grammophon, and he's he's quite famous and a great guy. And he does this prepared piano stuff quite a lot. MJ, do you know Hauschka? I, I don't. How do you spell it? H-A-U-S-C-H-K-A. -A. No, I, I can't say I'm familiar with him. Check him out. It's cool. He, he was originally on Fat Cat Records with Max Richter and Sugar Rose and Moom and all oh, that. Oh, okay. But he's, he's, not, he's on Deutsche Grammophon now? He did something with a, with a, a violinist. He did an album. Also with prepared piano, yeah. I'll, ch I'll ch see if it's on, uh, I'll check it out on title if it's on there. Yeah, it's probably there. Yeah. Well, we play with him a few times and he literally takes, takes the lid off and he has this like doctor's, old doctor's bag full of stuff. Yeah, so yeah. Felt and weaves the felt in between the strings. He puts yep. like many vibrators he got at a gas station, bath bathroom, like all sorts of things, coins, little sacks of things and like, so every, there's like percussion, there's muting. It's it's pretty interesting. Um, Michael in Dusseldorf, what is your Hi, record? Okay. You mentioned ah. him, MJ Bruckner. Yeah. And I put this one out because this is a very very special recording of his for a seventh symphony. And what's so special about this edition is that it is a direct-to-disc uh, uh, recording. And this makes it quite special. And I think what's also important to mention is that they used, I think, five microphones. Yeah. And uh, um, I've never heard an, an, an vinyl that, is, that comes so near to the real listening experience in a real with a real symphonic orchestra this is incredible it comes incredible close to the live experience and that's ma that makes this edition in my opinion very very special and i see mj down there he's he knows i think you know something uh, also about i have it yeah you have it it's I, it's so, um yeah yeah yeah, I, well, I wrote, a, I wrote a formal review for it for, for the website I write for. Um, mm -hmm. And I think like a couple days later, it actually sold out. I, I don't think I had anything to do with that, but it's just, it sold, it sold out quickly. You can claim that, come on. <laughs> what is, the, what is the website for those of you who are interested? Uh, in oh yeah, I, well, I mean, we can put a link down there. I write for a website called audiophilia.com. I'm one of uh, a, few, a few writers on that website that does, uh, it's vinyl reviews, music reviews, and equipment reviews. So for the for this performance that was direct to vinyl, how have you A B'd it to similar sonically uh, records that? Oh yeah, it's there's in terms of sonics, there's no comparison. It's the definitive audiophile version of Bruckner Seven. I mean, the the next best thing would be uh, like uh, Carl Joachim's uh, EMI, or sorry, not Carl Joachim's Eugene Joachim's EMI set uh, with uh, Dresden Stockspiel. For technical um, wants, is that one of those recordings that's multi mic or is it single mic for the orchestra? Do you know? The, are, are you talking about the, the directed set? The yeah, well, Michael, Michael just said it's, it's five microphones. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed but, they, but they, I mean, you know how direct disc works, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, they cut it right there in the, in the booth during a live performance, um, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of pressure for the musicians because if, if there's one mistake, 
you got to you, you do it again. I mean, if there's a big mistake, I, I heard a, a couple little mistakes in there, but it, in the same way that you would hear in a live performance, which is actually, to me, it's part of the appeal of, of the directed disc format because I'm tired of hearing shiny, perfect performances that don't sound like the real thing. Yeah, yeah I, I love that you say that because this also goes for all your file recordings. And, 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 you know, there are so many people who look for tiny, tiny mistakes or, 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 or wobblings or whatever. And of course you find them. Vinyl is not perfect uh, digital things. There are mistakes. And the same goes for those direct to disc uh, editions. I can live perfectly with some minor mistakes when I have on the other hand, this outstanding quality. So for this actual recording, obviously they're limited by the side of the vinyl, the physical side of the cutting surface. Do they do they kind of do half of half of the movements and then take a break and then flip flip sides on the cutter head? Or for this one, it was actually a, a, a one and a half LPs. So they they did the first movement on one side, the second movement on the other side, and then the third and fourth movement on the third side. And on the fourth side. Um, they, they have uh, the signatures of all the principal musicians in the orchestra, along with, with Bernard Heitzink. And, and um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but this was Bernard Heitzink's last uh, set of performances with the Berlin Phil, because right after he retired. This was like, this was like a year ago? Or something yeah. Like it's not, it's, it's new, a relatively new one. They put out 1,884 uh, pieces because that was the year uh, Bruckner uh, composed this uh, symphony. Beautiful edition, really beautiful edition. And it's, it's, they did it, in my opinion, because I have the original, the Brahms Symphonies box set that they did a, a year ago or two years ago now. And um, this is, they, they got better. Um, there were some sonic, pro the, the Brahms box set was great, but there was, I had some criticisms of the sound. They, they, they did this one so much better. Hmm. All right, I think we're on our last round now. So one more record each, MJ. Let's okay. Um, this one is just one of, it's, it's, I pull this out so much um, because it's one of my favorite recordings ever of probably my favorite symphony ever. And this is a uh, Andre Previn with the London Symphony Orchestra playing Rachmaninoff's second symphony. Um, I played this piece. This was one of the first pieces uh, when I was at MSN that I ever got to play principal on. And we played it with, uh, oh God, we had the guest conductor. Do you guys know who Philippe Entremont is? No, he I'm was a, a famous concert pianist. Uh, he, he did a lot of recordings with Bernstein and Eugene Ormandy on Columbia. He played like Saint-Saëns Second Concerto, brilliant pianist. He's too old to play piano now. So he, he fancies himself a conductor and he's one of the worst conductors I've ever worked with. <laughs> he, he, and he doesn't like it, 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 it uh, like half the time he'd just be shouting at us in French and we had no idea what was going on. I hope um, he doesn't look the vice, uh, vinyl community videos. Maybe I, I don't care. No one, no one's hiring him anymore. Um, <laughs> okay. We'll find you. <laughs> um, but uh, despite that, um, playing, this is probably one of the most fun things I've ever played. The music is just, I don't know if you guys have heard this symphony before. It's just gorgeous. It's, I think, Rachmaninoff's best work. It's so melodic um, and it, and it kind of takes you on an emotional roller coaster. And this recording, Previn, it, it's, it was, when this recording came out, it's interesting because it's one of the first times they recorded the complete version with all the repeats. Normally they, they would do a shorter version. They would take, they would leave out repeats and they would take cuts in places. And this is one of the first times someone actually sat down and recorded the whole thing. Um, and it's just, it, I, there's very few recordings that I think are, are so just uh, monumentally important in the repertoire as this one. And the sound on EMI, this is the 70s EMI, uh, the dog stamp label. And it's, the sound is just, Fantastic. Um, EMI is one of the few record labels, like unlike RCA, which went downhill in the 70s and Mercury went downhill and even um, Decca went downhill a little bit compared to some of the stuff they were doing in the 50s and 60s in the golden age. Um, I actually, in my opinion, I think 
the early EMIs are actually not great sonically and the stuff they were doing in the 70s was the best stuff they ever did, in my opinion. Mazzy, any notes on the, on the cover there? That, hold that up again, not, not really. I just, um, it's kind of your, your standard um, sort of per performance portrait. Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> nothing to say. <laughs> Next. Other than Andre, Andre Previn's extremely, uh, I don't know, can I say Cosby sweater anymore? It's a, it's a very colorful sweater. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, um, my last one is very contemporary. This is a double 10 inch from an Icelandic composer named Kjartan Svensson. Svensson? I don't know exactly how to say it. Um, and Michael in Germany will have to help me here. The Clown de Offenbarung des Gutlichen, which means. Not bad. Not yeah, that, that's, that sounded convincing. Which um, means, I the Clown der Offenbarung des Gutlichen. Which is the explosive sonics of divinity. Roughly. Of course it is. <laughs> yeah, 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 it, it, it fits. Yeah, you can say that. Great. So, uh, Kjartan uh, is known for being the keyboardist from the famous Icelandic band Sigurós. This oh, was thanks. his first solo production. This is a four-part opera um, that premiered at the Volksbühne in Berlin. And this is a double 10 inch. This is act the jacket is larger than a 10 inch and it's so thick that good luck getting the vinyl back in there. So I <laughs> uh, but this is so, so, so beautiful. Um, for those of the, into like the neoclassical Johann Johansson, Max Richter, like mm -hmm. that kind of world, this uh, is right rally. Um, there is operatic singing in it, um, be forewarned, but it is, the instrumentation is beautiful. And uh, this was pressed on a label called Bel Air Glamour, which I've never heard of, but very, rigid thick 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 pressing full color gatefold i think it's i think it might still be available this came out i think five four or five years ago but it's, it's really beautiful for like a very contemporary uh kind of neoclassical uh connection beautiful i love the black and white cover reminds me sort of ingmar bergman uh like mm -hmm. film yeah. can, can you show me a close-up of the back like it just pops some color i couldn't quite is that an illustration or yeah, that's all, they're all paintings. Wow. You know, you know what that cover reminds me of? You, you might know this, Michael. Um, do you ever listen to The Deer Hunter? Uh, I'm familiar with them, but not really. Oh, they, they're, they're not, not Deer Hunter like the animal, but like deer like addressing, yeah. Their, their album covers have, have those kind of like forest paintings like that on them. Reminds me of that. Gorgeous. And especially if you're into the Sigurós music. Oh, right, of course. This guy. Anyway, yeah, I think he's done a couple other film scores uh, since this, but this was the first thing he did on his own. Highly recommended. Mazzy, last choice. My last, my last one is kind of a personal record for me, non such record, the Cronus Quartet. Cronus Quartet, uh, again, Michael uh, in Austin talked about how you're a fan of string quartets. Big fan here. Again, it always goes back to the Beatles for me. Two pieces of music. George Martin's uh, original uh, uh, score he did uh, string arrangements for Eleanor Rigby and what he did with the cellos in um, well I am the walrus and strawberry fields to me are just magnificent and it got me turned on to this uh, I'll talk about the cover in a minute but um, this is 1988 recording uh, and this are they, they cover like eight different artists uh, winter was hard is Oslis Stalinen who I don't know, but of course, uh, there's a, a piece by Terry Riley. There's a piece by Arvo Part, uh, Anton Weeburn, of course, a John Zorn. So it's really a potpourri of, of modernists. John Lurie, who was a member of, uh, an actor and a member of the Lounge Lizards, the jazz thing, who was in Stranger Than Paradise, the Jim Jarmusch films, but really kind of that whole East, uh, Lower East Side, New York avant-garde jazz scene of the 80s mainly. Uh, Astor Piazzolla, um, Argentinian, uh, not a accordion. What do you call the? Uh, uh, ben, ben De Lo uh, ben, I was ben correct, I knew it was, and I said, uh, I did, a, I, I love Astor Piazzolla a lot. Um, Alfred Schmidtke, uh, a San, uh, Adagio, of course, famous piece. Oh, oh do you mean, do you mean Schnicka? Yes. 
I love Schnicka is great. I, I love Schnicka. I've, I've played quartet, um, number th quartet number three, a Samuel Barber Adagio, of course, and they close a traditional piece called A Door is a Jar. Now, the cover thing is really important to me because a uh, couple things. Uh, the cellist, I mean, the violist, uh, Joan Genreno, who's no longer with them for health reasons, was with them for 25 years. She is the godmother of my son. Um, my photographer that I represent, Michelle Clement, took the cover of, the, of these. Uh, the concept of the cover is supposed to be like Russian constructivism uh, photographs of, you know, the turn of the century, 20s and things. The designer, I was at this photo shoot in the late 80s. The designer who designed this cover is a guy named John Kosh, a British uh, record cover designer who I was in awe of because he goes by the name of Kosh. He designed the covers of Abbey Road for the Beatles, Let It Be for the Beatles, all the Linda Ronstadt records in the 70s. A great designer, but um, I just think this cover is so beautiful, so um, stark black and white and uh, even the detail covers of the shadows and everything. So um, Amazing. I love this. Uh, I love Kronos Quartet, Modernist, Minimalist. It, you know, they're still together to this day. They, they tour the world like 300 days of the, of the year. I think they've gone through three other cellists since Joni had to leave because of her uh, health situation. But she's done some great things on her own too. But uh, uh, one of my favorite albums that I just literally got uh, I was going to show, but um, it's from three years ago called Landfall that her they did with Laurie Anderson, a composition based on Hurricane Sandy. And it's just a great, minimalist, uh, intimate, wonderful, shocking piece of music. So, Probably one of the most famous pieces based on a hurricane. Pardon me? Just making it I got it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> the most famous hurricane. Yeah. Except for uh, Louisiana 1927 by Randy Newman, uh, written way before Katrina, but when Katrina happened, it really came out. They're trying to wash us away. They're trying to wash us away. Uh, you gotta bring some pop music references in there. But if you ever get a chance to see Kronos, whatever they do, uh, a lot of stuff's multi-image. Michelle Clement, the photographer who did this, did all their uh, photography from the late 80s into the early 90s, kind of their image, because they were one of the first of the classical quartets that had this sort of image-based thing too, almost as if they were a rock band. You know, they were heavily styled and everything and dramatic, not over the top, but it was a very part of their thing. You know, you'd, you'd, up to this point, you'd see these, the four classical quartets and they'd be sitting in their chairs, you know, kind of nerdy looking like the four of us here. Um, but they were like, literally like a rock band. And um, a out of San Francisco, point. and it's just an amazing international, uh, outfit that's a, yeah that's a very interesting point to bring up kind of changing the face of how they marketed themselves well it, and again they got uh, picked up by nonsuch they were, did a couple independent records before the, or a smaller label they did a great thing of the music of bill evans before that so they really merged into the genres not just classical um specifically and they do pretty much stay away from the traditional. I mean, they got it ready, uh, around this time some uh, airplay because they did a kind of interesting cover of uh, Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix. So that got some airplay. I need to, I need to find that. That looks cool. Yeah. No, this is at the tail end of, you know, when CDs were coming up. So um, you can still get this pretty cheaply. Is it my turn? My last turn? Your last, okay. you're it. Good. And the, we've got a winner. <laughs> yeah, someone's it. Uh, I'll give it later. At the very end, can you hang out for a minute and pick your iconic cover that will show well, and let's hold it up for a thumbnail each, so. Okay. Okay, um, I, I, I close the circle with my last one. I showed in, in the beginning, I showed, um, Vivaldi, Four Seasons, and now I, I finished with, with uh, Bolero. <laughs> wow. I think I have to get this, they're knocking again. Okay, again, and very, it's so popular up to now, and, and, and I understand why, because when you think, when you're in the half of, of, of this uh, one of, of, of Bolero, you think it can't get any better, but it gets better and better and better and better, more, more, more. 
and this makes this recording uh, uh, so special. And, and if you if you haven't heard that one, really highly recommend it. It's 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 gorgeous listening. It's it's very emotional, very emotional. And this living stereo is is a beautiful recording, and uh, still a very good availability. You can get it in in your in your uh, record stores. Beautiful pressing of an outstanding uh, composition, I think. And that great you know, RCA living stereo type again, color just really graphic. And that that sells you. Of course, the photograph is kind of interesting too. But that multicolored type, so sick, so early sixties. Admezi, I think the 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 photograph is a little outdated, isn't it? It's very well, 70. Was it 1962 or 60? Something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's early 60s. That's yeah. a great, I, I, have, I have both the original shaded dog of that and the new analog productions. And they're oh, both, they're both great. Long. I mean, it's I, long, I. It's 1956. Oh, wow. Well. You know, oh, so they, they recorded that before they could put it out on stereo. Because oh, RCA did stereo recordings uh, as early as 1954, I think. I think the first one they did was like uh, Pines of Rome. But they didn't have stereo records until 58. There's Respigi or... Respigi. Respigi, excuse me, see? Sorry, I was, I was making faces in the background because the, the doorbell was actually uh, the new speakers that I'm set to install. So, um, oh. <laughs> that was amazing. And for those of you who are, you know, maybe just getting into the vinyl world of classical, um, Analog Productions has the, the RCA Living Studio re -mastered. It's a great place to start. Yeah, and, and I was going to say that Munch is how you say it, the conductor yeah. of, Bolero, of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He is one that they are, were heavily repressed as well as um, the Reiner with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Or there's a, a lot of titles that all sound great. Yeah, and the stuff that, especially the stuff that Munch did of, of French repertoire, I mean, Munch was a French man, and, and um, he, that, that was very much where he was at home. And while he was the conductor of the Boston Symphony, that orchestra really became known for their interpretations of French Impressionist music. Amazing. Well, we have a lot to study and research and listen to, I think. I hope so, I hope so. Yeah, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll do some more of these, and let's... Grab your, and there'll be links below. Oh, do I have to pick one now? Pick okay. one that works graphically on the screen, please. Hold it closer, Michael, uh, from all, yeah. Not that close, a little, okay. I feel like a photographer now. Give me a little sugar. Uh, MJ, yeah, he tilted. Yeah, I, the, uh, it's the window, yeah. Little in towards you. Uh, come on, give me some sugar, baby. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there we go, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. But I have to say, I have to say something. MJ, you showed me tonight how far away I am from saying I know something about classical music. Thank you very much. Well, I think people should know they can't be, they don't be afraid of it. I mean, I just jumped no. into it. Right. Just go into it. Try and, it. And don't be afraid to go. We didn't show a lot of the, well, we, Vivaldi and, and, and we, didn't, we didn't even show Beethoven. There's a lot of start, if you like that stuff, start with it. Don't start with art with, um, with crumb, definitely. <laughs> well, I think, I think, you know, there's something for everyone in classical music because classical music incorporates so many different things uh, from so many different time periods. I mean, for me, uh, I've always, from an early age, I've always been fascinated with history. I, I'm very much someone that likes to read about history and kind of understand what life was like for different people at different times. So for me, classical music is a window into that. So I always, I'm always relating to classical via history and how it sits in the context of what was going on at the time. So that's just, uh, that, that's how I talk about music and that's how I come to appreciate music, I think. But everyone approaches it from different ways because I know so many of my colleagues don't think about music like that. Right, whatever works for you. Listen to the music. Just be, right. that. be, be inspired. That's it. I second that. <laughs> hey, thanks. Uh, links in descriptions below. See you next time, guys. All right, take Thank care. You. Thank, you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this has been fun.